Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at the tools and techniques of password cracking. Now, before we dive in, what is hashing? Well, I like to think of it as a fingerprint, a process that takes some data of an arbitrary length and converts it into a fixed length string of characters or value. We can then use this to verify the original data. I'll take a moment to mention that, of course, not all hashing functions are created equal. So when we're talking about theory, of course, there are always exceptions. Sometimes we have what's called collisions, where different data will often produce the same output. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but as far as I understand, it's impossible for a hashing function to be completely collision free. And this makes sense because what we're doing is we're taking a smaller set of values to represent a larger set. But hashes are designed to be collision resistant, and we'll touch more on some insecure hashing algorithms later on. So the process of creating a hash involves taking the original data and running it through a hashing function. The output of the function is the hash, which is a fixed length string of characters. The same input data will always produce the same outputs, but it is, or at least should be, practically impossible to recreate the original data from the hash alone. I saw a great analogy on the web once. It's basically like cat poo. The cat has eaten the food, so it's mixed, digested, dehydrated, and what comes out is your hash. The main use cases are things like password storage, data integrity checking, digital signatures, and the main attacks that we're going to look at are dictionary attacks, brute force attacks, lookup tables, and finally, rainbow tables. As we go through these attacks, I'll try and demonstrate a couple of different tools like Hashcat and John. And if you like the video, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Let's dive in. Let's take a look at some hashes that you will run into when you're testing web applications. Starting with the infamous MD5, of course, that's been around since the early 90s. It's fast, but considered insecure because it's vulnerable to collision, length extension, and pre-image attacks. But today is all about cracking, so the fact that it's very fast to calculate means that it's also very fast to crack. Next, we have SHA-1, which has mostly been replaced by SHA-256 and SHA-3 and other algorithms, but you might see it from time to time, and is also a relatively fast algorithm and considered insecure. Now, I'll take a moment to say that I'm not going to cover every single hashing algorithm, just some of the key ones that I think you'll bump into when you're testing web applications. Of course, you may need to do further research. Next up, we have Bcrypt, which I personally use when I'm building web applications. It's a variation of the Blowfish algorithm and is built to be hard to crack. And we might see this later on when we try and crack a Bcrypt hash. It uses techniques called iterative hashing and adaptive hashing to basically be time-consuming and computationally expensive. The last on our list is Argon2, which I suppose, if you're using a slightly older algorithm like Bcrypt, is the next step up. If you're not sure what algorithm to use to hash passwords, then chances are you should go with this one. Now, all of these were generated on my local Kali instance, so here are the commands I used if you want to create some hashes and then try cracking them for yourself. For Argon2, you probably need to sudo apt install Argon2, but for the others, I think they all come prepackaged with the latest Kali instance. Now, let's take a look at how we can identify hashes. Sometimes you'll know exactly what hash is being used because of the structure, where it came from, maybe you have access to the source code. If we do manage to get our hands on a hash and we aren't exactly sure what it is, there are a few different ways to try and identify it. So first up, we'll take a look at a couple of tools in Kali. So Hash Identifier, which comes pre-installed, and HiT, which is actually a tool that a viewer recommended to me during a live stream, and I've basically been using it since. So let's take a quick look. So I have this file with all of the hashes in here and also I've separated them out into text files just to make life a little bit easier. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a hash identifier first. So I'll just load this up quickly and let's see how it identifies each of these hashes. So we're just going to grab the MD5 to begin with, paste this in. And you can see that it comes up with a lot of results, but actually these results are the unlikely ones. You want to scroll up and you want to see the possible hashes. And you can see that it does identify MD5, 
And it also says, ah, this also looks like domain cached credentials. That gives us a pretty clear indication of where we want to begin, which is pretty handy. Next up, we're gonna take a look at SHA-1. So I just copy, paste, and it does the same thing. And if we scroll up, it says SHA-1 and MySQL 5 SHA-1 as well. So this is a pretty good indication of what the hash is. Our next one, what was next? SHA-256. And then we will grab this, paste it in, and we get SHA-256 and HAVL-256 as well. And we don't see this very often, but I think there's a whole family of HAVL hash functions that exist, but I don't really have any experience using them, but you might see them from time to time kicking around. Uh, next up, we have our bcrypt. So I'll just grab this one paste this in. And interestingly enough, it doesn't find bcrypt, so we get not found, which given the structure is quite familiar as well. So 2y is, I think, the most recent version or definitely a more secure version than 2a of bcrypt. And 10, I think, is the cost. So you can increase the cost of generating the hash when you create it. So it's a little surprising considering that it has quite a specific structure that you know, hash identifier didn't find this, but that's okay. And last up, we have argon2. So we'll just grab this, paste this in, and it actually thinks this is SHA-256 and HAVL-256 as well. So maybe the hash identifier tool is a little bit out of date and struggles with newer, more up-to-date hashes. So what we're going to do is have a quick look at IT. So I, uh, we can just run IT and pass in the hash. And this doesn't come packaged with Kali, so you'll have to go to the GitHub and install it. And let's just take a look at bcrypt. So we'll just copy this, paste here. Ah, but of course it's using special characters. So actually if we run this again and just add some quotes, hopefully it will give us a result. And there we go, okay. So we get bcrypt as a result and we also get the hashcat attack mode and the John the Ripper format as well, which is pretty handy. Let's give argon2 a quick go. And unfortunately, thinks this is SHA-256 or, or something else. So again, kind of hit and miss, good for some algorithms and unfortunately misses for others. Another way to identify these hashes is using the web. So if I just, whoops. So if I just come to Google and if I search for identify a hash site, and then we get things like tunnels up and hashes.com and onlinehashcrack.com. So let's just try the first, first one to begin with. And what we want to do is try and get this bcrypt one identified. Salt, not found, character length. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So it doesn't look like it knows what it is. Let's try argon2. thinks argon2 is SHA-256, so interesting. Let's try one more, so hashes.com, and I think we can, if I recall, copy and paste in multiple hashes here. So in fact, let's just do the whole lot, see what it comes back with. And it does successfully identify bcrypt. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see this. So you can see possible algorithms bcrypt, but it didn't identify the argon2. So mixed results, which makes things a little bit tricky. And you can see that it also returned the results of the first three hashes as well. So cheesecake was the inputs for all of the algorithms. Although of course, blowfish and argon2 require a salt. So you can't use rainbow tables uh, unless you used a very predictable salt, I suppose, to identify these hashes, which 
we'll talk about in the next section. And last thing I want to show you all is if I just come back to uh, Google quickly and we just go to hashcat identify hash and we find this examples page, you can see that this is usually how we grab the hash mode for hashcat. So when we're cracking hashes, we need to tell it what type of hash we're trying to crack. So if your hash mode is zero, for example, we're cracking MD5. If it's 100, we're cracking SHA-1. And sorry if the text is a little bit small. There we go. So this is also a useful reference uh, for you. So definitely worth bookmarking this page. So with four out of five hashes identified successfully, we should try cracking some. Now we're going to start with a dictionary attack. So we basically find or create a file full of common words or phrases that have a high probability of being the same thing that somebody used as their password, such as password one, two, three. And sometimes we do further processing, like we will change the E's to threes or the L's to ones, or we'll add one or two or three on the end or exclamation marks, for example. Each word is then hashed in turn, and then the hash is compared to the original hash that we're trying to crack. If they match, then we know the original text file that was used to create that hash. So this is a dictionary attack, and let's give it a try using... Oops, using hashcat. So what I'm going to do is we're just going to go hashcats and I think we need the attack mode of zero for dictionary. If you not if you're not sure, you can just dash h and then, you know, it will display the help and we can see somewhere in here. The help file is actually very long, but I'm pretty sure it's um, dash a0 hashcat dash a zero for dictionary attack dash m zero for md5 and then we're just going to pass in our md5 and then we're going to use the word list user share word lists rock you the very infamous one and that's it so very very fast uh, as we can see and if we want to see the cracked password we can just do dash dash show and it tells us that the password is cheesecake. Now, if we wanted to do the same thing, but for uh, bcrypt, which is going to be much, much slower, let me just pass in bcrypt. And I think the mode is 3200. I'm going to have to check. Let me come back to. Yeah, 3200, and you can see the two and the star. So this will be the older versions of bcrypt and the newer versions as well. So if you see $2y or $2a, you should be good to go with 3200. So dash m3200, and we'll hit enter. And if you look at the speed value, so 3131, uh, um, we can compare this to how fast it's going to crack the bcrypt password as well. So I'm just going to hit S for the status, and you can see that it's much, much slower. And this is actually going to take a little while. So what we're going to do is probably just hit Q to quit. And it's progress. It got through about 2,002 passwords. So getting through 14 million is obviously going to take quite a long time. I know we stopped it quite early, but 0.02% through the 14 million words that are in uh, Rock U. All right, so next up we have brute force attacks. So if we're not sure what the password is, or if we think it's been randomly generated, so using uh, like alphanumeric, zero to nine, special characters, different cases, then a brute force attack is probably the best way to go. And this basically tries every combination of characters possible. So it's gonna be go something like A, B, C, D, and then A, 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 B, A, C, whoops, A, C, A, D, and then A, 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 B, A, A, C, A, A, D. And it's going to go through every single iteration up to whatever character length you chose. So obviously, as the password gets longer or the original text that we hashed gets longer, the strength increases dramatically. So going from nine characters to 10 characters, obviously it's going to take longer to crack. Then going from 10 to 11, it's going to take 
even longer, it's going to get exponentially harder. And when we add more characters, such as numbers and special characters and different cases, we can say that this has higher entropy. So let's do this one with John's. Sorry about that, my VM just crashed. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to run John, but if we run it without any word list, it's just going to give us a default word list. So what we're going to do is we're going to use incremental mode and set it to alpha, which I think is just basically all lowercase characters. We can define custom rules like length and character sets, but for now this should work. So pseudo John MD5 incremental equals oops alpha and then we're just going to pass in the format raw md5 and we'll give this a second to run so if the password is long and complex this will take a very very long time but as you can see we have a relatively short and simple password so it takes no time at all so still fairly easy to crack with this method so that's hashcat and john out of the way now the next attack is called a lookup table, and this attack is not quite as well known as the previous two, but it's a really effective way of cracking large numbers of hashes. So in a previous pen test that I've done, we used this method to audit the passwords of the organization after dumping all of the hashes from the domain controller. Also, if you manage to dump a large number of hashes out of a database from a web application, you can try this attack as well. And the idea is to pre-compute the hashes of passwords and store them in a lookup table. When we take each hash, we do a lookup and see if it exists. So as I'm sure you can tell, this saves a tremendous amount of computing power versus the dictionary attack, as we don't need to recalculate the hash of each entry in our list each time we feed it a new hash. We just do it once and the rest is lookups. And finally, we have rainbow tables that are basically pre-computed lookup tables. After we have our tables, we can proceed with the lookup attack. So finally, I want to talk to you about salt and pepper. These are used to make hashes stronger and more resistant to attacks. Salting is where a random value is added to each password before it's hashed, and then generally stored alongside that password in the database. Now that a salt has been added, it makes using pre-computed tables, such as rainbow tables, impossible. If two users have the same password, the hashes for that password with salting would be different from the standard hash generated from the same password and different to each other. So in this case, an attacker would need to create hash tables for each individual password. If the salt is the same for every password in the database, then this is a mistake. I'd say a misconfiguration or development mistake. I should also mention here that assault is not a secret and in theory shouldn't need protecting beyond being stored in the database and only read when generating a password hash for comparison, such as when the user logs in. It's not a secret. Pepper, on the other hand, is a secret value added to each password before it's hashed. It's the same value for all users and not stored in the database. It's important that it isn't stored here because it helps protect the hashes even when the database is compromised, essentially adding a secret layer of security to the password hashing process. Both of these methods make cracking passwords much more difficult. So that's it for today's video. Now, if you want a little bit of a challenge and take your knowledge further, then I definitely recommend coming over to Try Hack Me. Come to the search, search for hash, and then you've got some challenges like crack the hash and some other CTFs that involve cracking hashes. This is a great place to continue your study and reinforce what we've learned today. See you next time.